Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 322. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Do you know the best way to protect your vehicle, both the exterior and interior, is with a car cover? I've been using Covercraft car covers since 1975. It's a fast, easy, and inexpensive way to keep your vehicle looking new. 2015 marks Covercraft's 50th anniversary. They've manufactured premium quality exterior and interior covers here in the United States with a reputation for durability and design. They're the world's largest manufacturer of custom patterned vehicle covers that are crafted to fit with over 80,000 patterns and growing. You can choose from dozens of fabric options and accessories, all designed and carefully sewn for your special vehicle. Made in the USA, Covercraft is the right choice. I've protected my special rides with their covers for over 40 years, and you should too. Learn more today at Covercraft.com. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. Today, I am revved up and so excited to introduce a very special guest, Andy Pilgrim. Andy, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I certainly am, sir. I have a six-point harness on my couch ready to go. (laughs) Awesome. I would expect nothing less from you. Andy Pilgrim is the founder of Electronic Computer Services based in Florida. ECS is an IT consulting company he's owned since 1989. But in 2008, he started the Traffic Safety Education to help educate new drivers, parents, and teachers about driving safely. He's been a professional race car driver since 1984, and he currently drives through GM Racing for Team Cadillac in an ATS VR. He's earned 63 wins in 10 different series and has five professional championship wins. He finished 116 consecutive IMSA races, And the number 92 Mobile One Corvette that he raced in 1991 is on permanent exhibit in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. as the only example of an American-built GT sports car. And his name's on the roof. That's pretty cool. So, Andy, I've told our listeners a little bit about you. Would you share a little bit more about your history and your passion for racing? Yes, absolutely, Mark. Um, And thank you for the introduction. I I, I haven't read a my own resume in a while, so that was that was uh, new <laughs> new information, really. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, as far as um, yeah, the career, the journey, and the race car driver. When, when I was younger, um, I had definitely had an, a very, very uh, much of an interesting cause. I don't know why particularly. My family was not involved in that at all. Um, my dad did used to go to a local racetrack to spectate the motorcycle racing. But I'd always, I loved motorcycles, but I had a real interesting car. So I think it started very young. There was no, um, there was no possibility of me, you know, racing go-karts and doing the things that, um, you know, you have to have money for that. We didn't, we just didn't have that money. Uh, but there was certainly an interesting car as we started very, very early. Um, I sort of got into uh, a moped. I sold, bought and sold things, uh, basically stuff to get a second-hand bicycle. Then I got a, a moped and, and something with an engine when I was about 15, 16 years old. So the interest in engines was, was still there. Cool. Progressed onto motorcycles. And actually, when I, when I uh, left college to go into computer programming, which was in the um, you know, late 70s, early 80s, yeah. it was basically that, that I just, uh, it was then that I had enough money, if you like, to start sponsoring myself because that was the only chance so i took my street motorcycle kind of wired the drain plug and used to sort of pay a buddy of mine some gas money to take me to a racetrack and he dumped me at the racetrack and you know if it was still alive he'd pick me up in the evening <laughs> and that was it so uh, you know when i paid him the gas money to pick me up and dump me off and that's yeah. how, I, how i started i ended up winning some races then in bike racing after about three years two two and a half seasons of doing that i had an opportunity to come to the states as a computer program and so, um, you know, I had my three years of experience, and uh, I loved racing the bikes, but it wasn't really what I wanted to do. If I had a chance, I wanted to race cars. Mm-hmm. Came to the States, worked really hard, saved some money. After about three years and a little bit of autocross for, for a year in my street, uh, Volkswagen Rabbit, um, GTI back then in the mid-'80s, um, I bought a second-hand Renault Cup car, 
and those cars were like 11 to 12 grand new. I couldn't afford a new one, so I got a second hand one for 6,500 bucks off a, a buddy of mine who's still a friend of mine, Don Campbell, out in uh, Las Vegas, bought his car. Wow. And it was cherry. I, you know, Don hadn't been particularly competitive. He loved it, but the car was cherry. So I got a cherry car for like half price. Nice. And, uh, you could drive the car to the racetrack. About at least 60%, 70% of the guys used to drive the cars to the track. It was a West Coast-based series and an East Coast-based series. Well, I lived in Dallas at the time. I'd moved from El Paso to Dallas. And I had my first race, believe it or not, I, I drove the car from Dallas, Texas to um, Riverside, California, and raced it. He drove so, drove the race car all the way in yeah, there. Yeah, 14, wow. 1,400 miles with no AC. Oh, my gosh. Uh, to basically, to, yeah, because it was street legal. You know, and I, was, it was, I was, you know, young and stupid. I was 20, 27 years old or whatever. Yeah. I thought, hey, Why I not? Yeah. So that's what I did. I mean, that's where the journey started was the Inserano Cup Series. Uh, and that's how it all started. And, well, you know, slowly but surely, you know, somebody gave me an opportunity in an endurance race. I, I could, you know, I, I paid money for two endurance races. I had three grand because that's what I got for selling the Renault Cup car. Uh, and I bought the Renault Cup car, you know, with money I saved up from programming. And, and then, you know, I did two races with that team in 1986. Said, hey, it's been awesome. Thanks a lot. I still, wait a minute, where are you going? I said, well, I don't have any more money. That's my three grand. That was it, 1500 a weekend, and I was done. Yeah. And the guy said, wait, 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 okay, come back. Uh, I can't pay you, but if you can get yourself to the race, you can drive for free. And that's where it started, 1986, that was. Very cool. Well, you know, that's why I wanted to have you on the show, Andy. A fellow friend, Kevin Beard suggested I call you, and I love your story in so many ways. Even though your profession hasn't been in the automotive field, uh, your passion for wanting to be involved enabled you to figure out ways to just get it done. So it's a great story, and we're going to learn a little bit more about all this as we move through here. But I always like to start by asking my guests for a success quote, some kind of saying that's been instrumental in your life and forming your success. It's a great way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars, yeah? So, Andy, I know you love to drive. Take the wheel. Yeah, no, thanks, man. Actually, there's there's two quotes. I have to say two uh, because they've been sort of equally instrumental. One, um, I'm a huge fan of uh, Winston Churchill in the sense of just studying history and, uh, you know, uh, an amazing amazing man. Uh, I certainly don't want to bore your listeners with any more than he was an amazing man, but he was well known for doing brilliant quotes. Yep. And uh, one of them, one of them, of course, was never, ever, ever give up. Yes. And you know, of course, he's well known for that. The other one was my mom, actually. Uh, my mom's culture, the very sort of a, a working class background, um, was just basically just get on with it. <laughs> in the sense of no matter what goes wrong, just get over it, get on with it, move forward. You're not dead. Keep going. And so I think in the sense of adversity in racing, too many people get stuck on what may have been, could have been that moment. And it doesn't matter whether you're doing a fast qualifying lap. If you mess up, move past it. And, of course, so many things happen in racing and life. Just get on with it. Move forward. Get by it. And that, that, those are the two quotes I would uh, two great quotes. We've had uh, several guests list Winston Churchill's quote, but of course, the first we've heard of your mom's quote, which is equally inspiring. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think mm-hmm. it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. How have you incorporated those into your success, not only in business, but in racing? Well, I mean, you know, you don't want to hop on the fact. I mean, I, I really and honestly did come here with $100 in cash in my pocket. I had a job. But I was so naive at 23 years old when I got here in the in the early 80s, I didn't realize that I wasn't going to get paid for three weeks. Mm. So I basically landed in Manhattan and, uh, you know, I had 100 bucks and I was like, I, I thought I was going to get a paycheck like in advance, yeah. you know, when you start. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, well, little did I know. So, I mean, the first thing I did, right, was 100 bucks for three weeks in Manhattan. That's where they based me, you know, in a, in a hotel, if you like, in a cheap hotel. So I wasn't paying the hotel, obviously. Until they found me a project, um, yeah. you know, first thing I did was like learn how to borrow money from some guy in New Jersey, and you know, thirty years later, I'm still paying. That, <laughs> you, you still know? owe him a few bucks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, sure. Otherwise, he's going to break my knee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, well, again, <laughs> ha- those those quotes are all about just getting on with it, never giving up, and in racing, as in business, of course, there's so many obstacles that get in our way. So. I'd love for you to share a huge challenge or a great failure that you faced along the way where you had to institute these 
these sayings, these quote. But more importantly, tell us how you overcame that situation and what did you learn from it? Well, in the sense of, um, you know, I think I think it's little failures. I, I believe a great big failure would be, you know, something that's almost career ending. And, you know, at this point, um, nothing's come up like that. But of course, when you when you thought you were in a position to win a race, potentially, and you did, when you thought you were in a position to win a championship, and you didn't. You know, when you when you may have made a small mistake or even, a you know, whatever kind of mistake you made, whatever it was, you just you just have to the, the it just gives you the strength to get by it. Understanding that there's all I mean, it sounds cliche. There's many things, you know, there are always people worse off than you. You know, there are always you know, there's always another day. Hopefully, if you're still standing, you know, there's always another day. You hope if the you know, if the mess wasn't too big. And I always learn from others. And when the, the guys like myself, the, you get an opportunity sometimes to drive a car or you're given a, you know, just given a chance to test something. There's a lot of things that come up oh, through the, when you come up like this, rather than just somebody writes a check and you're in a car and that's it, or you have a sponsor that takes care of your career. Great. I, it's wonderful. And I, I, I think that's awesome. But when you don't, you have these small chances, maybe a chance to test a car, maybe a chance even to race a car. And I saw so many guys who started in a similar position to me who when they got that chance, they made a mistake, a big mistake in the sense maybe they crashed or something, and it ended their career because that was their one shot. If they'd done well, they would have got a ride, and then maybe got other rides. And it was like when I noticed these things or I saw these things or friends of mine had the unfortunate you know, had to have the unfortunate uh, crash or whatever. Mm-hmm. It was like, man, you have to really mentally be strong and you have to be ready for every opportunity that comes up. And I think that's the whole thing. These are the little things that went wrong along the way made me stronger and made me understand that it's all on me. I have to make it count when I get the opportunity to make it count. And I think that was the biggest thing I learned from all the little things that went wrong along the way. Was there one situation you can think back that pushed you so close to that edge you're ready to throw the towel in that you can share with us? Honestly, honestly, Mark, I'm being honest, no, never. Oh, well, you it's are one fortunate guy. It's never even occurred guy. to me. <laughs> it's never even occurred to me because it wasn't about the fact that I could just keep going without the money. It was just never going to be an issue. Yeah. I was going to find another way around it. There, is, there are no problems. There are only solutions. Uh, you might not like the solution. The solution may not be ideal for you, but no, to be honest, no, uh, it hasn't. It, that hasn't happened. You know, I love what you just said. A friend of mine years and years ago when I was young and starting off in a career, I said something about, oh, we have a big problem. And he said, there are no problems. There's only challenges and solutions, what you just said. So yeah. I've tried to yeah. ingrain that yeah. into my mind that turn a problem into a challenge, turn a challenge yeah. into a solution. So great way to state yeah. that. Let's shift gears here and go to the other end of the spectrum. I'd love for you to share a story. When you had a real aha moment in your racing career, a point where you mm-hmm. just went, you know what? I think I could do this. And tell us the steps you took to turn that aha moment into a continuing success? Well, I have to go back to a, a Renault Cup. I'll be honest with you. You know, I got in, I got into Renault Cup, and I, I, uh, the first race at Riverside had 51 cars. I qualified 18th out of 51. So my first ever pro race, I hadn't really raced anything. I got straight into that. That was it. I'd done no FDCA or anything at that point. Uh-huh. I just basically got into that race. I'd probably done two or three other, one, one or two other little races with the Renault Cup car just to sort of figure it out. And then we went to this Riverside thing and I finished ninth. I finished ninth and I won 500 bucks <laughs> finishing ninth in that race. Yeah. Now that in itself did, that in itself didn't do it. What it was, I was running with guys like Mitch Wright, Parker Johnstone, who went on to do Indy cars, Mitch Wright, who went on to do Trans Am. And I mean, great guys, oh, yeah. really, really fast guys. And it was at, um, it was actually at Watkins Glen at the East West runoffs that year where the East and West Coast and I ended up on the podium. Wow. And it was like, you know, there's hundred and forty guys here, all wannabes. You know, they're in this entry level pro series. They pay money down to twenty fifth place, you know, little money. But it was a great way, you know, there was one of the best entry level series ever. It was superb. Only lasted a couple of years, three years I guess. And uh, that aha moment, when I was standing on the podium like with the guys like Parker Johnstone and Mitch Wright, I thought to myself, well, 
I, I think I can do this. And that was my first year. Uh, that was my first year in, in pro racing, my first year in racing, basically. Wow. And that was like, I got to keep pushing here because that was it. I had to... I had to find out if I might be any good, and that was the that was the race at that Watkins Glen East West runoff when I said, you know what, if I if I'm not too stupid here and I keep pushing in the right direction, maybe there's a shot. Very cool, wonderful story. Thank you for that. How about this? What was your first really special race car? That race car you got in that not only you went, you know what, this is what I've been striving for, but something that was really special for you. And if you could share a memory or a race you had with that car. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The uh, I think I think it was the Corvette, the Corvette, um, the Corvette GT1 car. I've been in some great cars. I've been in some great Porsches, BMWs, and things like that. I think it was uh, I think it was the the Corvette at Le Mans in nineteen uh, in two thousand when we went to the first time that Corvette went back to Le Mans since you know the sixties. Mm-hmm. I was lucky enough to be in one of the cars, and uh, it was this big thundering V8, you know. Yeah, and it was just it was just like the um, the interest in that car for the thousands of people that were at Le Mans. They were just really standing around the car, and we hadn't fired them up yet. We were waiting. You know, it's very official there. Nobody fires up until time starts on the clock for practice and all the rest of it. Right. And there must have been oh, must have been five hundred people around the Corvette pit had a garage area or whatever, all the photographers and everything were standing there. And when I fired this thing up, all the looks on these European faces <laughs> were just like, whoa, <laughs> Uh-oh, we're this in trouble. Is a serious piece. Yeah. yeah. Because the Vipers, the Vipers didn't sound like that. Right. And the Corvette would just have this unique sound. And I thought, damn, I'm sitting here. I'm going to be the first one turning wheels at it uh, at Le Mans with this car, with, you know, GM racing, you know, sitting there you know watching what i'm doing whatever and i thought this is this is so cool i'm i like i made it now you know what i mean it was oh, like yeah. wow i made it oh you know how I mean, fantastic yeah. yeah yeah it reminds yeah. me of you know when shelby took the cobras uh to europe and fired those things up or mm-hmm. the gt40s yeah. and everybody just went whoa what's that <laughs> You yeah, know? yeah, exactly. Anything different. I think people just love something different, you know? Yeah, well, that V8, yeah. too. The V8s are just, uh, they make a sound. Oh, and that, that thing, that thing sounds ridiculous. It sounded ridiculous. I mean, it about made every one of us deaf, but it was just <laughs> incredible, you know? Oh, what an experience. What a fortunate guy you are. Let's have a little bit of fun here. What was your most memorable race? And kind of take us through that adrenaline pumping experience you had and share some of the moments that really stand out in your mind? Well, I think the most memorable race has to be uh, the, the 2001 24 Hours of Daytona when I was lucky enough to drive with Dale Earnhardt and uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and my regular teammate uh, back then, Kelly Collins. Yeah. Um, that race, that whole five-month period of getting to know Dale like I did, we became very close friends off the track and that whole thing just was was a just a. It's almost like you dreamed the whole thing because unfortunately, two weeks after the race, he was uh, taken away from everybody. Yes, uh, and uh, you know, fatally at the 500, and so the yeah. whole thing becomes sort of like a dream sequence mm-hmm. because it's like nothing after that, and everything just went completely pear shaped, and it was just very strange, uh, but also wonderful memories. The whole race was great. Dale was great. Junior Junior was very new to dealing with rain and you know he did a great job too but it was difficult very difficult conditions extremely difficult conditions Mm -hmm. and uh kelly and i you know kelly and i everybody did a great job we ended up second which was great you know even though you know in dale's words second sucks don't it son (laughs) yes but but that's what he said you know so but uh it was it was tremendous it was a tremendous opportunity uh phenomenal running with his number three on the car which has never done never happened before you know or since in the corvette Oh yeah, uh, they they could you know because Richard Childress owned that three, and he allowed us to use it. Of course, when Dale was in the car, which was totally brilliant. Oh, wonderful! You know, Kelly's been a guest on the show here at Cars. Yeah, love Kelly. Uh, uh, yeah, don't see him. Don't see him enough. Don't see him enough these days. Yeah, he's, he's awesome. Yeah, he's a great guy, and he shared the same answer to that question that that race w- racing with no you doubt, and the Arnhards. It. Yeah, it was such a special race. So wow, what a awesome opportunity you had to do that fantastic how about current projects is there something you're working on you're doing right now 
that really has you excited and fired up. I know you're driving for Cadillac, and maybe you can share a little bit about that, but what are you doing today that really has you fired up on the track? Well, on the track, of course, we've got a new ATS VR. I yeah. mean, the new Cadillac ATS VR, it's a new car for us this year. The engineers are learning. The crew guys are learning. I'm learning. Uh, being a GT3 car, it has uh, quite a bit more downforce than our um, than our car we were using for the previous four years, which was a wonderful car, the CTS V. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, what can I tell you? Every every time I get in that car, I have to pinch myself and go, you know what, this is just awesome. The <laughs> fact that they, you know, rolled me over into this third generation of race cars now because I did the first two mm-hmm. is just fantastic. I mean, I, I'm so, I feel so lucky, so privileged to be to be able to run the car. And where are all the places you guys are racing that car? Gosh, all over. I mean, I say all over. Long Beach, obviously, St. Pete, uh, Most Ford. We are Most Ford, Detroit, obviously, for the Mega Grand Prix there. And one of our races had to be canceled due to incredibly horrible weather. Mm-hmm. Um, but we made up that one at Elkhart Lake. And then Mid-Ohio is coming up next week. But we'll be out. You guys will be out in uh, Laguna and on the West Coast, I mean, yeah. out of Laguna and Sonoma coming up uh, in literally in a few weeks. Yeah, yeah, um, exciting. So, and then we're going to Utah as well. So we're racing it all over. So again, every time I go to the track with this car, it's going to be a first time with this car. So Barber Motorsports Park seems to suit the car quite well. Uh, some of the other tracks, you know, seem to suit some of the other cars a little bit better. Mm-hmm. But all a all massive learning curve. I mean, a tremendous opportunity to drive this car. It's amazing. It's not as loud as the uh, the V8, and it doesn't have that thundering thundering noise. And people say, oh, oh you know, I- I'm going to miss the V8. And then they come back at the end of the week and go, that car sounds awesome. <laughs> it's like, you know, it sounds, and I mean, I've sort of coined this thing where it just says, to me, it sounds like it's just ripping holes in the air. Um, it does have a completely unique sound uh, for any other V8 turbo. And I think they did <laughs> whatever they did or if they meant to do it, they've given this car such a brilliant sound. It's, it's excellent. Well, I love that ripping holes in the air. You know, Cadillac has done such an amazing job over the, gosh, almost like the last 10 years plus of, of changing their whole identity and making their cars just so much more of a sports type model. My, I'm going to see my cousin Jim down at the Pebble Beach uh, Monterey Laguna Seca races coming up in August here. And uh, actually, by the time this show airs, it'll be passed. But he just bought two brand new Cadillacs for his family and just loves mm. them. Just loves them. You know, just awesome well, cars. We, we, lo- we, lo- we, lo- we love him. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Thank you, no, Cousin Jim. Thank you. Yeah, and he's going to be loaning, yeah. loaning me one for driving while I'm down there during the week. So I can't wait to get in that car and enjoy it a little bit. So it'll be Excellent. great. No, the, the Cadillac's doing a great job. I mean, they really have changed the emphasis. You know, obviously, they've been a standard of luxury. Uh, you know, an elegance for years. Now we've got performance. And I think they had to do that. If you yeah. look at Mercedes, BMW, and Audi, now we're competing absolutely on par with them, just destroying them in the handling side, according to all the car magazines, which is brilliant. Yes, yeah, it's fantastic to see American car maker doing what they're doing. It's great. Now, here's a very introspective question for you, Andy. I always love the way people answer this. If you were a car, and specifically a race car, since you're a driver, what kind of race car would you be and why? That's a great question. And I was having a hard time figuring that out. I yeah, really was. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's unique. It's a... was, yeah, <laughs> it, it, if I was a race car, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of all the favorite cars that I absolutely love to drive and everything else. But I think, I think I'm just going to go with, with the most recent because I'm having so much fun with this ATS VR. I'm being serious as far as the downforce, the braking, all the things that are in a new territory. And I remember I've been with the Cadillac team for a long time, over a decade. And it's like, uh, I think right now I'm going to go with the newest. I like to be the newest. So I'm going <laughs> to say the Cadillac ATS VR at this point. Yeah, oh, you know, I think it fits you because of your IT business, of course, which we haven't talked much about. But, uh, you know, being in the um, technology industry and having to be on the cutting edge of everything in order to compete, it makes a lot of sense that you would be the most recent Cadillac race car. So I think that's a perfect answer for you. So Andy, up next is the last lap. But before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars Yeah sponsor. Do you love vintage cars? Then go to CarsYeah.com and get a free copy of the fantastic Filler Up book. It's a full-color ebook filled with fuel filler fun. 
with over 60 color photographs of vintage cars, plus inspirational quotes from some of the most famous automotive enthusiasts of all time. Simply go to CarsYad.com and click on the free book button on the homepage. Download your free filler-up book today at Cars Yad. No more worries about a dead battery. I've got the NOCO Genius Boost Jump Starter. This compact tool fits in your glove box and features rechargeable lithium-ion technology that'll start a dead battery in your car, boat, truck, or RV. It packs a whopping 12-volt, 400-amp starting power and can start up to 20 dead batteries on a single charge. Plus, it has built-in spark-proof technology and reverse polarity protection to safely jumpstart your vehicle every time. Includes a built-in ultra-bright dual LED flashlight, and it easily recharges with USB outlets so you can charge your smartphone or tablet while you're on the road. Works on any 12-volt lead-acid battery. The Genius Boost from NOCO is the ultimate emergency tool that's safe and easy to use. Quality, design, state-of-the-art technology from NOCO, your battery care source since 1914. Get yours at Genius Charger dot com all right andy we're back and we're entering the last lap you're a racer and you know what that means the white flag's out time to put your foot into it and i'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some quick blips of the throttle answers so you ready yes sir what's the best racing advice you've ever received and who was it from uh the best racing advice i ever received basically was uh, was elliot Fuller's robinson Believe it or not, Elliot Fools Robinson. I was hanging out with him at Daytona, and he he just basically said, "Patience, be patient." And it was at a 24-hour race, and he was so right. <laughs> you know, it's a great answer. I uh, first time I raced vintage cars, nothing close to what you guys do. But the first time I raced was in a Lotus 18, 1960 car. It was raining. I was petrified. And the gentleman who was helping me, another past guest here on Cars, yeah, Louis Shevchik, came up and put his hand on my shoulder and said, the throttle goes both ways. And I think that was mm-hmm. his way mm-hmm. of saying, be patient. <laughs> be careful. There you go. Yeah, but be yeah, patient. Probably. Could you share one of your personal habits that you believe has contributed to your success in racing over the years? Well, uh, certainly uh, teaching myself fit. Um, I'm in my 50s now, and I'm still doing this at a, you know, at a very high level. And uh, fitness and getting tired has never been an issue. And I think just, just keeping yourself as fit as possible uh, takes something out of the equation, a variable that I think some people start getting into as they get older. And they don't, especially with the types of cars running now, mm-hmm. the cars I'm running aren't, they, they, they're getting, they've got tremendous defaults in braking and turning and everything else. So I think fitness, keeping yourself as fit as possible for as long as possible, especially when you're getting into faster cars. Absolutely. Do you have a resource that you'd like to share with our listeners you think they would really enjoy? Uh, a resource in the sense of? Oh, like a website or an app that you get, or maybe it's a blog that you receive every week. Something that's, you know, kind of fun, keeps you engaged either in the sport or in the automotive world. I am uh, completely remiss in doing things like that. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I, I, would, I would only say that the biggest resource I ever thought about in racing was a very old book, and you could still find copies of it. And it's the, the thing I would say to anybody getting into racing, how to make your car handle by a guy called Fred Poon, that's P-U-H-N. Um, that book, I ingested that book when I started racing because I realized at my level anyway of needing an extra, needing something extra, learning about setup was, was critical. It wasn't just enough to be a fast race car driver. You had to be able to transfer that information back to the engineer. So uh-huh. that resource uh, is, is the only one that I've sort of ingested. And because I, I do, my foundation stuff is keeping me very, very busy. And because of the IT company, I don't have a chance to do a whole lot of else, to be honest. No, that's great. In fact, you answered my next question. I always ask our guests here about a book or for a book they think our listeners would enjoy. So. We'll make sure that we post that book up on your show notes page as well as a special place we have on the site, Guest Recommended Books here at Cars Yeah. And you can find all these links at carsyeah.com slash Andy Pilgrim. All right, we're up to the checkered flag now, Andy, and this last question can be a real doozy. If you could only have one collector car, and I'll include collector race car in your garage, but it's not something you can sell to buy a bunch of other toys with, so that little trick's off the table. But don't worry about the cost, because today I'm buying. What would that one vehicle be, and why? That would be the number three car that I drove with Dale and Dale Jr. and Kelly. 
I would love to have that car in my garage, and I would certainly never, ever let it go. <laughs> wow. Awesome, awesome choice. Well, that one's going to cost me a little bit, I think. Where does that car reside these days? I believe, um, oh gosh, I believe Mid-America, the gentleman that owns Mid-America, uh, and I forgot his name, um, I think he has that car. Okay. And I, I, I forget the gentleman's name. But anyway, yeah, it, it's, it's well kept. It's well cared for, <laughs> that much I know. Awesome. Well, I'll Google that and give him a call and see if I can get him to uh, let go of that car for you so I can put it in your garage. I'm not going to hold my breath on that one. <laughs> okay. Well, have a little faith, my friend. Have a little faith. Andy, you have taken me on a great ride around the track today. I've really enjoyed talking with you, and I want to thank you for sharing your journey with the Cars Yeah listeners and with me. Could you give us one parting piece of guidance before you drive off down the racetrack in that number three race car? Yeah, I'd say uh, eyes up, eyes on the road, and forget the, forget the cell phone, forget the infotainment system. Just eyes up and pay attention out there. There's a ton of distracted drivers on the road these days, guys. Oh, gosh, absolutely. Eyes up. Great advice. And what's the best way for our listeners to learn more about you and Cadillac Racing? Um, myself, Andy, at andypilgrim.com is the website, and you can always go to uh, Cadillac.com. Cadillac.com has information about the race team and all, obviously all about Cadillac's uh, production cars. Fantastic. Yeah, great sites, both of those. I encourage our listeners to visit those. And you can find links again to those sites and everything else we've talked about today on Andy Shono's page at carsyad.com. Just type Andy into the search box and his show notes page will pop right up. Andy, thanks for being so generous today with your time and your expertise and for sharing your experiences with our listeners. We'll see you on the racetrack this summer as you continue racing with Cadillac. Until we talk again, I'll see you down the road. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.